Hey guys, it's a gloomy Sunday afternoon and um, what better opportunity do I have to get the All Grain Primer series kicked off? Today's video is specifically about mashing and some grain characteristics that make mashing possible. So I have some, um, some grain here. This is Brewer's Malt. Um, I have some American Two Row and then I have some uh, Munich Malt and then I have some uh, Black Malt or Black Patent Malt which was highly uh, kiln to make this roasty uh, flavor. All right, so what's a mash? Let's, uh, let's start with defining what mashing is. It's basically a mixture of grain and water, right? Um, that's essentially the layman's terminology for it, but the purpose is to make sugar water. We're specifically making uh, maltose sugar water. And the reason why we want to make sugar water is that that's the wort that the yeast will consume to make alcohol. All right, so I have some hot water here. All right, it's about 164 degrees. And I have some milled grain here. And this is just a handful, it's not any specific weight, but you can see that there's a mix of um, the husk material as well as the white endosperm inside right so let's uh let's put this grain in here so as you're when you're mashing <clears throat> this is what would you would call the grain bill or the grist once it's milled and the act of putting the grist into your strike water is called doughing in. Okay, and you're making this uh, ouch, hot. You're making this uh, consistency of like oatmeal. So you can see basically the grain and the hot water is mixed. Let's see, the temperature is about 154. Yeah, 153 and a half, something like that. It's going to take a little bit of temperature. The grain's going to take some of that heat away. All right, so that's essentially what a mash is, right? And again, the purpose is to convert starch in the grain to maltose sugar water and some other sugars, but for the most part, it's mostly maltose that we're looking for. Okay, let's set this aside. We'll talk about it again in a second. Okay. We have to talk about grain in general before we move on. It's really um, obvious. It's the seed of the barley plant. But um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, the natural purpose is obviously to fall into the soil below the barley plant to germinate and then create another barley plant. That's sort of the whole point of seeds, right? Uh, but think about how plants get their energy. Uh, for the most part, it's uh, through photosynthesis. It's, um, you know, capturing energy from the sun into the green part of the plant, like the leaves mostly. Uh, and there's also the rootlets and roots that go down into the soil and it pulls uh, nutrients out of the soil and moisture. But think about a seed when it first starts germinate, just when it starts sprouting. There's no way that uh, it has enough green uh, or enough roots to derive energy in the way that a, a mature plant does. So it has to have a small store of energy within the grain itself. So if you were to crack open uh, a, a barley seed or any seed for that matter, you'll see that uh, that white hard sac called the, the endosperm that I talked about earlier. Uh, well, that's the, the storage of energy for a for a plant. There's a lot of uh, starch potential, a lot of energy potential in here, and that's really what uh, the brewers are looking to exploit. We're trying to uh, modify this or convert all of this starch energy into sugar water. Um, now the endosperm as it stands is a complex carbohydrate. It's a starch. Uh, yeast cannot process on that. If you were to able to dissolve that in water, uh, and pitch yeast, it wouldn't do anything. You wouldn't, it wouldn't ferment because uh, brewer's yeast cannot uh, consume uh, that, those complex starches. 
So the mashing process is required to convert that long chain carb into simpler sugars like maltose. So uh, what happens is, is the first thing we need to do is malt it, right? Malting is the process where we simulate, or the maltster, and let's face it, not, a, not all brewers are malting their own barley, but the maltster will take raw barley as it's harvested out of the fields and uh, soak it in some uh, warm water, basically. And what they're doing is simulating the process that the seed would normally go through as it, if it were germinating in soil. So it activates the seed and it starts uh, sprouting a little bit off the top. And um, what's happening is enzymes within the, the, the grain start modifying the starch to get it ready for use by the, uh, by the plant. So as it's growing, it's slowly converting some of that starch into uh, uh, more simple sugars uh, so that the plant can use it as energy. Now, the, th the thing is, is when you're malting, uh, you don't want it to keep growing into a barley plant. Otherwise, brewers wouldn't be able to use it. So what the maltsters do is um, halt that, that modification process or that, or that conversion and the growth by drying the seed out again. All right, so it doesn't continue uh, growing into a plant. So what they do is they'll, they'll spread it out on the floor and raise the temperature of the room to dry it out. Uh, and in some cases, they, uh, they raise the temperature quite a bit. It's called kilning. And that's, you know, that's where you end up with the, uh, the slightly darker malts like the Munichs and the Viennas. Um, and then eventually, if you wanted to go all the way out to this dark color, you can go to like a, uh, a chocolate malt or a brown malt or black patent for that matter and uh, create those really dark malts by using a higher temperature. So you're, you're really just, uh, you're roasting it at that point. All right. So I talked about the enzymes, nat natural enzymes. So one of the things that happens is uh, when, when the kilning occurs at a lower temperature to create these light base malts, uh, the enzymes are stay intact they basically become dormant at that point okay and the enzyme is really just this catalyst for a chemical reaction uh, that does this uh, starch to sugar conversion process there's a lot of different enzymes that are present in malted barley but by far the one that brewers care about the most is amylase and uh, you've heard of alpha amylase or beta amylase those are two different varieties of uh, the amylase enzyme and the malts that are uh, kilned at a very low temperature just to dry it out and set, set the grain uh, to dry it, uh, they have a very high level of amylase left. And as you go warmer in the kilning process and, and go to the darker malts, uh, there is less and less of the amylase left over from the process. Basically, when you get to the black malt area and the chocolate malt area, uh, it's been kiln at such a high temperature that the amylase is completely uh, destroyed at that point. Now, so, so now we're establishing the fact that there are var varying levels of amylase enzyme left in the malt, uh, depending on the, uh, the darkness of the kil or kilning uh, length and temperature. Uh, the measure of how much amylase enzyme is left is called diastatic power, and the unit of measure is called uh, percent lint uh, lintner. Uh, or I should say degrees Lintner, not percent, um, degrees Lintner. And it's, a, it's a, denoted with a big L, similar to love -a bond which is kind of confusing. But um, So I talked a little bit about uh, diastatic power. Now, let's just go back to this, uh, this mash again, okay? This has been sitting here, you know, in, in the mid-150 degree area. Um, is this really a mash? Well, you would have to ask some more questions about it, right? Like, what type of malt is it? Is it a, an American two-row? Is it a Vienna or Munich? Or is it a, a black patent? Well, we can see that it's not a black patent, right? It looks a little bit like the two-row. Are we mashing? Well, are we sure that this is two-row? Um, well, it's not. So it's uh, it's actually uh, this is Crystal 10L, right? 10 Lovabond caramel malt, and uh, that's one thing that we didn't talk about. 
Okay, so uh, caramel malts is one thing that I didn't describe, which I think I should because it's such a common um, grain that uh, people use. During the malting phase where they're uh, getting the grain to germinate, to convert the starches initially, uh, with crystal or cara malt, anything with the cara preceding the name, like cara hell, cara foam, uh, cara pills, all those different um, cara names, essentially what they do is they, they extend the uh, hydration period longer than usual, and they start increasing the temperature up into the mashing temperatures, like 150 degrees, you know, around that area. And what happens is the amylase enzyme gets activated within the grain husk itself in its own little package. And essentially it mashes and it turns that starch into sugar. And then they continue kilning it and drying it after that point. So it, they call it crystal malt because it crystallizes the sugar inside the grain itself. And that's why uh, it, it's uh, usable as a steeping grain. So one of the things is, is that because the enzymes get used uh, during the creation of the crystal malt uh, and it's kilned afterwards, there is no uh, amylase left in caramel malts. So along with the darker roasted malts like the chocolate browns and the, uh, the black patents, um, all your caram type malts do not have any uh, amylase left at all. So their diastatic power is near zero or if not zero. Um, so you're left with the, the lighter kilned malts like the American two row pale malts, uh, pilsners, and then you step into like Vienna's that are moderately kilned and Munich's. And again, Munich's are, um, the enzymes left are dependent again on how long it's kilned and what the love bond is. So the darker it is, the less uh, amylase is left. Again, this is all 100% crystal malts. It's uh, a little bit of sugar that was in the malt originally as crystallized has diffused into the water. Um, in the steeping process, if you will, but uh, there is no enzymatic amylase activity going on here. There is no um, conversion happening. So whatever sugar was in the grain to begin with is seeping into the water, but there's no new starch being converted. So in this situation, I'm getting about 10 to 15 percent of the sugar that was in uh, potentially in this grain into the water, and that's the end of it. So what can we do to make that a real mash? All we have to do is take a grain that is high in enzymes, amylase enzymes, and add it to the, to the mixture. Um, but how do we know how much we need? Well, that's something that's dependent on the diastatic power uh, measurement of the grain. So let's make believe that this variety of, of malt here is what we're going to add to our mash um, to begin with. So we have some American two row again, uh, American two row is very high in diastatic power. It in fact has, um, on the degrees Lintner scale, it's about a hundred to 120, um, Lintner. Uh, we have some light Munich here, which is lower. It's about 40, um, degrees Lintner. And then again, we have our black patent, which has zero, uh, zero degrees Lintner. It's no diastatic power. Um, and if these were in equal increments here, this could be mashed. Um, the, a, a grain is said to have enough diastatic power to convert itself when it has about 30 to 40 degrees Lintner. So that's um, what we have. Munich is, is known to be a self-converting base malt in that it has just enough diastatic power to convert itself in about 60 minutes in a normal mash. Uh, and the American two row has about three times the diastatic power that it needs to self-convert. So when you add all that up, it could easily convert this uh, additional third malt, a third of the grain bill that doesn't have any power on its own. Okay, so you could do a little bit of uh, math and average the overall grain bill by how much power it has and figure out if it's gonna convert in a reasonable time. Now, what if a mash has way more than enough diastatic power, like a 100% two row mash? Well, that just means that the, the conversion is going to happen much quicker, right? Think of, think of the diastatic power as a measure of, um, of uh, let's say, amylase is Pac-Man, 
and the starch load of the mash is like the little pellets that it has to eat on the on the pac-man board well diastatic power is a measure of how many pac-man you have on the board as opposed to the how much uh, starch you have so the more you know overall diastatic power you have in your mash or in your overall grain bill determines how fast the mash is going to convert Okay, if you're using a 100% Munich malt, which is just enough to convert itself, it'll probably work in about 60 to 70 minutes at, you know, 155 degrees. But if you start um, moving into a mix of no diastatic power with a little bit of Munich, then it's going to take forever to mash. Essentially, it'll get done. It's just a matter of how long you're willing to mash for. All right, so that's really all I wanted to cover today. Um, it's kind of a, a lot of material and... Uh, for some people, it's it's a little obscure, but I think it's important because, you know, inevitably when you learn how to brew uh, all grain beers or, or partial mash beers uh, by following a recipe or by imitating somebody that you saw, uh, you're going to be real happy that you ended up with a decent beer. And I think one of the first reactions is, is well, I'm going to just start buying some ingredients and making it my own uh, recipe. Uh, but don't fall into the trap of trying to create a mash with uh, an overabundance of grains that have no diastatic power whatsoever. All right, um, some of the types of beers that uh, really need to be considered uh, where diastatic power has to be considered is like wheat beers that use flaked wheat or unmalted wheat or beers that are high in um, other grain like adjuncts like corn, uh, flaked corn or flaked rice. If you're trying to imitate like a macro beer style, uh, it would have a lot of unmalted grains in it. So you do have to consider that. Again, all the different grains that brewers use uh, have an associated diastatic power if it is a malted grain. And you can find charts all over the place that have the diastatic power listed. I can uh, point you to a few sources of that, those lists. Um, so you know, keep that in mind when you're trying to design a recipe. Just make sure that you have enough diastatic power to convert the mash. and. If it's on the low side, uh, make sure you give yourself a uh, longer time to let the starch to sugar conversion happen. All right, guys, I will see you on the next installment of the All Grain Primer series. Take care. I like old beverage, eh? uh -huh.